Mark, after these atrocities that occurred in Israel this past Saturday, uh, there's a lot going on. And many people think that Hamas didn't act alone, but in fact, perhaps had the help of countries such as Iran. What do you think about that? Oh, I think it's incontrovertible that the Iranians were behind this. Um, I mean, this is part of the Iranian Supreme Leader Ali Khamenei's stra- longstanding strategy, which is to surround Israel with uh, with a ring of fire on every border, which are you know uh, terrorists, missiles, huge conventional weapons, and uh, and to squeeze Israel, to asphyxiate Israel. He wants to kill as many as Israelis as possible, and he wants to drive out. Uh, the rest of Israelis who, who don't want to live in fear. So this is a longstanding strategy. We've also got, you know, overwhelming evidence. I mean, there have been a number of planning meetings uh, in Damascus, in Tehran, in uh, in Beirut, involving senior IRGC, Islamic Revolutionary Guard commanders and heads of Hezbollah, uh, Hamas, Islamic Jihad. And so, you know, this, there's coordination, there is planning, there is direction, not to mention, of course, uh, a billion dollars a year of funding of Hezbollah, Hamas, and Islamic Jihad, and the supply of, of weaponry. So Iran's hands are behind this, part of a longstanding strategy by Khamenei. And uh, yeah, but the brutal slaughter that you saw over the past few days shouldn't surprise anyone because Khamenei has been brutally slaughtering his own people and helping Vladimir Putin brutally slaughter Ukrainians. So do you see parallels between Putin's actions internationally and those of the Ayatollah? What's going on? I think there are many parallels. I mean, I think the first parallel is there's a perception by Putin and by Khamenei and other uh, dictators in what I call the sort of axis of tyrannies um, that they can push forward and all they will be met with is sort of American mosh um, instead of American steel. And they all are drawing lessons from each other. Right. So it's, uh, you know, Putin can move into Ukraine and that sends a message to uh, the Ayatollah that he can move into Israel. Um, She is watching this from China and there's you know growing evidence that she believes the United States does not have the resolve or the capabilities to defend Taiwan. Certainly, uh, you know, I'm sure the North Koreans are looking for every opportunity uh, to perhaps use some of the same tactics against South Korea. And, and on and on and on around the world. They all learn from each other. And it's all about the perceptions of American power and, and the lack of American resolve. How close of coordination do you think there is between, say, Moscow and Tehran, these two dictatorships? Uh, do they work together on ideological bounds? Or why is it they're tied together? And what do you think they hold for the future? Yeah, I mean, look, I don't think they share common ideology. Um, I mean, one is an Islamist theocracy. Uh, you know, the other one is a neo-Stalinist uh, dictatorship, I think what they do share uh, is a hatred of America. They share a hatred of, of democracy and democracies, um, and they, they want power, and they are closely coordinating. I mean, there's close coordination between Iran and Russia on the, on the military side. Obviously, the Iranians have provided uh, significant quantities of suicide drones that Putin has used to, to massacre Ukrainians. Um, In just a couple of days time, the UN embargo on uh, Iranian transfer and purchases of missiles will expire. And when that expires, um, the Russians and the Iranians will be under no international restrictions to transfer advanced missiles uh, between Moscow and Tehran. And and my expectation is, uh, you know, Tehran's advancing uh, will transfer sophisticated missiles to the Russians that the Russians will use against Ukraine and uh, potentially the Russians will transfer fighter jets and other advanced weapon systems that the Iranians will be using in their uh, Middle Eastern aggression. So close coordination, common objectives, common enemies, um, military, certainly a lot of sanctions busting um, cooperation. The Iranians are masters at sanctions busting. So Tehran and Moscow are joined at the hip. So looking forward, it's looking pretty bad. How do you think things will play out? If we don't do anything, can we hope this will just go away by itself? What should be done? Look, I think what should be done, first and foremost, in the immediate theater, in the immediate uh, coming days and weeks, I think the Israelis have, are now taking off the gloves. I mean, I think they've realized that, you know, a uh, over a decade policy of limited strikes against Hamas, of um, limited rules of engagement, of trying to 
desperately minimize civilian casualties as they hunt down Hamas targets and weapons inside Gaza has failed. That strategy has failed. Hamas has been uh, empowered, emboldened, and supplied by Iran, as I mentioned. So they are now going to move in, and they are they have a objective of destroying Hamas's control over Gaza. I mean, I I think Hamas and the Supreme Leader in Iran have badly miscalculated. Um, Israeli resolve and Israeli fury in the same way that Vladimir Putin badly miscalculated Ukrainian courage and Ukrainian resolve and Ukrainian fury. Um, you know, when a free people, they are often slow to anger, but when they are dealt uh, these kinds of atrocities, free nations are can fight. And the Ukrainians and Israelis share a lot in common, right? A love of life, whereas their enemies celebrate death and a, a desire to be free. And so I expect Israel uh, will recover from this brutal few days and uh, you will see the courage, uh, the resilience and the capabilities of the Israeli people over the coming weeks. So that's about Gaza. That's the immediate coming weeks. I think the Israelis also want to demonstrate that anybody else who tries to inflict this kind of damage on them will suffer grave consequences. That's a warning to Hezbollah on their northern border, which is an Iranian proxy. It's a warning to the terrorist organizations uh, on their eastern border. It's a warning to the terrorist organizations in Iran on their northeastern border. And there I'm talking about Lebanon and Syria. I'm talking about uh, even Jordan. Uh, these are places where the Iranians are trying to use their proxies to, to circle Israel and to, to strang strangle Israel. Then, and, and I'll finish with this, the most immediate um, or the, the long-term strategic threat to Israel is Iran. And uh, Israel, after it recovers from these terrible days, accomplishes its short-term objectives, will exact uh, revenge on Iran. And that revenge will come in many ways. Um, and I think the Supreme Leader, Leader has badly miscalculated Israeli resolve. So is there anything else you'd like to say, Mark? Yeah, I mean, Jason, I think just in conclusion, I, I just want to show, um, express as an American, my gratitude to uh, President Zelensky, the Ukrainian people. I mean, they have shown wall-to-wall -wall support for our ally Israel. I think President Zelensky understands um, what Israel is facing, the, the obviously the brutal attacks um, that, of course, his country has faced from Putin. He understands what the Israelis are, are suffering from. And I, I just think it, it, it's been a very important statement, um, both uh, from the heart, but also for those of us who strongly support Ukraine and Washington. I think it'll be very helpful as we continue to beat back those people in D.C. who are calling for the U.S. to cut off military support for our strong ally in Ukraine. Mark, that's fascinating. We appreciate your time. Thank you for having me.